The Rhine is one of Europe's longest rivers. 1,320 kilometers long and crossing six countries, it's a backbone for industry and transport and a source of water for more than 50 million people. The history of this river is an excellent example of why environmental action is needed at a European level. It was also the Rhine which was largely responsible for inspiring the European Directive on Water Protection. To better understand this, it's off to Worms in Germany. In the shadow of a centuries-old tower, this building houses the biggest Rhine water control station in the network, which monitors the quality of the river water. Mr. Egli is a teacher. As he does every year, he's brought his students to visit the laboratories to make them aware of how important it is to protect their water. And he knows what he's talking about, because he remembers the Rhine 30 years ago. Summer 1964 was the last time that I swam in the Rhine, and it smelt so bad and was so polluted that I felt nauseous and was sick. And I said then I wouldn't swim here anymore. And I haven't done so since then. But I'd rather like to swim across the Rhine again, but I don't dare to anymore because I'm a bit out of practice. However, if somebody swam with me or just kept an eye on me, I'd like to do so again in the summer. As proof of the river's improved state of health, salmon have returned to the Rhine. Around here, they call it a miracle. After the Second World War, economic recovery was all that mattered. For three decades, everything was simply dumped in the river. Wastewater and industrial waste went in completely untreated. The Rhine became Europe's largest open sewer until the 1970s, when German legislation prescribed the creation of treatment stations in the major industrial areas. A good example is here in Ludwigshafen, a dozen kilometers upstream of Worms. Welcome to BASF, the world's largest chemical plant. Here, everything is on a huge scale. More than 200 production units operate side by side on a dozen or so square kilometers on the banks of the Rhine. The company was one of the first to effectively throw its hat into the ring by constructing a treatment station which remains the biggest of its kind in Europe. This treatment plant is huge. It's able to treat the wastewater of several million people, for example, of a city the size of Paris. The cleaned water flows into the Rhine after treatment. The station can treat 4,500 liters of water per second. Today, protecting the environment is a priority. The environmental protection begins directly at the production plant and not at the treatment plant. Even if the treatment plant represents the heart of water protection for us, we start in the production. That's to say, we select the process, choose the input materials and adopt the protective measures. But the real wake-up call came in 1986 with a fire at the Sandos plant in Switzerland. The water used to put out the fire carried 30 tons of pesticides with it as it flowed back into the Rhine. All aquatic life within a 400 kilometer stretch of the river was killed. This demonstrates the fact that pollution knows no frontiers. Countries through which the Rhine flows had to improve international cooperation. Together they charged the Commission for the Protection of the Rhine with establishing a drastic plan for purifying and protecting the river. This accident was, as I always said, a worst-case scenario for the politicians and the industry because it established the fact that the everyday work that we had carried out until 1986 was, on its own, inadequate and that we needed to do more. And then the politicians decided that large investment programs in municipal treatment plants, as well as investment programs in industry, in the chemical industry, should be started up. And as water pollution knows no frontiers, they decided we had to also cooperate at cross border level. According to the director of the control station in Worms, thanks to this cross-border cooperation, the water quality of the Rhine is much improved now. I think these two diagrams provide a good illustration. 
You can see from the different colors when the situation was bad. Forty years are represented here. Thirty years ago, the bad situation was in the red area, and the situation is clearly better today. And if you look at the biology, there's a similar picture. This diagram shows how the number of species has changed from many animal species a hundred years ago, most of which had died out 40 years ago, to almost as many species today as a hundred years ago. The story of the Rhine could have been that of any other river in Europe. This is why in 2000 the European Union adopted a directive which notably imposed the principle of cross-border water management, introducing the concept of river basin management. In other words, frontiers do not matter. The territory of the river is what must be taken into account. Concerted action is also required for the 2,850 kilometer long Danube that flows beyond the EU. The countries in the Danube River Basin know this well and are now actively cooperating to improve their waters. Fresh water or seawater on the surface or underground, Europe is determined to protect water in all its forms. From the quality of drinking water through the treatment of wastewater to protection of its rivers, coasts and lakes, it has over time developed a legislative arsenal covering all its aspects. Notably since the 1970s, the European Union has regulated the management and control of the quality of bathing water. And here, informing citizens has been paramount. Once a year, each member state must publish a health report on its bathing water. From poor to excellent, anyone can find out the quality of water anywhere in Europe. And human activity likely to pollute bathing water is also subjected to special measures. At Geirvan, for example, on the west coast of Scotland, a wastewater treatment station has been installed to eliminate bacteria from fecal matter present in the water. But strict regulations have also been imposed on local farmers to stop slurry being deposited in the rivers and the sea. Some of the codes of practice we'd say do not apply within 10 metres of water course, do not apply to steep sloping land not to wet soils, not to frosty soils, and so on. It is essential that farmers use these codes to minimize the risk of fecal bacteria getting into water courses. One practice that can give rise to water pollution is when large herds of animals are drinking water from rivers and streams. So an easy technique which farmers can utilize is using drinking troughs, water troughs there, where uh, the animals can access water from the trough, the drinking trough, and not the stream. Today, the results are obvious everywhere in Europe. Since 1990, the number of bathing sites fulfilling the EU standards has increased by almost 30%. Nowadays, 90% of our bathing areas have clean and safe water. But environmental pressures persist and new challenges constantly emerge. We need to ensure that clean waters are kept clean and available in sufficient quantity. The objective of the European Union is that all the water on its territory should be in good chemical and biological status by 2015 and to reconcile our use of water with the requirements of nature.